The Bolsheviks Come to Power by Alexander Rabinowitch. Chapter 13 The Garrison Crisis in the Military Revolutionary Committee. Among Bolshevik leaders who shared Lenin's impatience to have done with the provisional government, reactions to the obstacles connected with an immediate armed uprising were varied. In the face of continuing concern that the insurrectionary organs, weapons, and trained personnel for an organized insurrection were not yet ready, that seizure of power by the Bolsheviks alone would be opposed by all other major political parties, by the peasants in the provinces and the soldiers at the front, indeed perhaps even by such mass democratic institutions as the Soviets and trade unions, as well as by elements within the Bolshevik party itself. And finally, that even workers and soldiers in Petrograd were unresponsive to calls for a rising before the Congress of Soviets. Some Bolshevik officials counseled simply that the start of an insurrection be postponed, pending further preparation. As we have seen, this was the response of the military organization chiefs Podvoisky and Nevsky, who consistently viewed the seizure of power in purely military terms. Another approach which gradually suggested itself to tactically cautious Bolsheviks, often those most active in the Soviets or in other local representative institutions, and hence particularly attuned to the prevailing mass mood, ran along the following lines. One, that the Soviets, because of their stature in the eyes of workers and soldiers, oops, and the organs of the party should be employed for the overthrow of the provisional government. Two, that for the broadest support, any attack on the government should be masked as a defensive operation on behalf of the Soviets. Three, thus that action should be delayed until a suitable excuse for giving battle presented itself. Four, that to undercut potential resistance and maximize the, the probability of success, every opportunity should be utilized to subvert the provisional government's power peacefully. And five, that the formal overthrow of the government should be linked with and legitimized by the decisions of the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets. While this was, in many respects, an extension of the politics and outlook of the Bolshevik left before October 10th, these tactics were now to be pursued much more aggressively. It should be borne in mind as well that most Bolsheviks holding these views, either in full or in part, were confident that a majority at the coming Congress of Soviets would support a transfer of power to the Soviets. Their most influential spokesman was Trotsky, but his outlook was shared by a significant number of other top Bolsheviks, including Stalin. Framed against this background, the provisional government's sudden announcement in the second week of October of plans to move the bulk of the Petrograd garrison to the front came as a godsend to the Bolsheviks. It provided a perfect immediate cause around which a decisive struggle with the Kerensky regime could be initiated. Outwardly, the Russian cabinet's decision regarding disposition of garrison units was tied to German military moves in the Baltic. It will be recalled that on August 20th, German forces had occupied the key seaport of Riga, it had seemed that, for the first time in the long war, the enemy might attempt an early advance on Petrograd itself. It should also be remembered that on the eve of the Kornilov affair, Kerensky had used the possibility of a further German advance to justify transfer of sizable numbers of Bolshevized garrison troops to the Northern Front. Concern about an, em concern about an em enemy attack on Petrograd, again, mounted sharply in the first week of October when German air and amphibious forces carried out a brilliantly successful sneak attack, capturing the small but strategically important islands of Ozel and Moon at the entrance to the Gulf of Riga and Dago at the mouth of the Gulf of Finland. As a result, the entire Russian Baltic fleet was driven back into the Finnish Gulf. Appraising the significance of these setbacks, the chief of staff of the Russian army, General Nikolai Dukanin, declared in the pre-parliament that with the loss of these islands, which for us are keys to the Baltic in the full sense of the term, we are in effect back to the age of Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich, our outlets to the sea controlled by Germany. 
in Petrograd news in Petrograd news of these most recent military disasters gave rise to a storm of mutual recriminations. The government, along with liberal and conservative circles, implied that the unruly Baltic sailors were primarily to blame, even before the German assault was well underway. Kerensky himself had helped to fuel these charges, demanding in a message immediately released to the press that the sailors put an end to consciously or unconsciously playing into the hands of the enemy. He asserted, the Kronstadters have already succeeded in seeing to it that in this critical hour, not all of our defenses are in place. After the islands had fallen, Kerensky, at a closed meeting of a pre-parliament committee for defense matters, contended that fully adequate military planning for the protection of the islands had come to naught because of the cowardice, lack of discipline, and demoralization of the naval units charged with their defense. On the other hand, the extreme left spoke up for the sailors, accusing the government and the general staff of intentionally mismanaging Russia's defense defenses in order to justify political um, repression, resurrecting claims first raised against top civil and military authorities after the unexpected Russian retreat from Riga. Such accusations quickly helped intensify popular fears that Kerensky was preparing to surrender Petrograd in order to stifle the revolution. Apprehension in this regard reached fever pitch in the wake of rumors, later substantiated, that the provisional government was making preparations for a hasty move to Moscow and a sensational, widely publicized speech by Mikhail Rodzienko, the well-known, formerly powerful president of the State Duma. Addressing the possibility that the Germans might take Petrograd, Rodzienko declared directly, Petrograd appears threatened. I say to hell with Petrograd. People fear our central institutions in Petrograd will be destroyed. To this, let me say that I should be glad if these institutions are destroyed because they have brought Russia nothing but grief. There's no direct evidence that the provisional government ever seriously entertained the idea of surrendering Petrograd to the Germans without a fight. Moreover, Russian military leaders do not appear to have considered an early German attack on Petrograd likely in the fall of 1917. What does seem to be true is that, as in late August, the embattled Kerensky perceived the apparent German threat as an excellent excuse to rid the capital once and for all of the more unruly elements in the garrison. At this time, the provisional government's commissar on the northern front, Wojtynski, was assigned the task of facilitating the removal from the capital of the more unreliable garrison regiments replacing them with less corrupt units from the army in the field. Simultaneously, on October 5th, the government directed General Polkovnikov, commander of the Petrograd Military District, to prepare his troops for transfer to the front. And the following day, Polkovnikov issued preliminary instructions to key commanders. According to Wojtynski, Cheremisov himself had little taste for such an operation, feeling that the transfer of troops from Petrograd would only increase problems at the front. This is confirmed by a classified telegram which Cheremisov sent to the War Ministry on October 17th, clarifying his attitude toward the receipt of garrison troops. The initiative for dispatch of garrison troops to the front came from you, not from me. When it became apparent that garrison units were incapable of fighting, I said that from an operational point of view, they were of little need to us. We have enough such units as it is. In view of the desire you have expressed to send them to the front, however, I do not reject them, if you consider their movement from Petrograd necessary. Despite his reservations on October 9th, Cheremisov issued a supplementary order, drafted by Wojtynski, endorsing Polkovnikov's directives and justifying them on the grounds that such action was absolutely vital to the defense of the capital from the Germans. Soldiers in Petrograd reacted to news of these orders with predictable vehemence. In unison, garrison troops proclaimed their lack of confidence in the provisional government and demanded the transfer of power to the Soviets. 
As in the aftermath of the Kornilov crisis, all the major garrison regiments that had been reluctant to follow the Bolsheviks during the July uprising now repudiated the provisional government and pledged support to the Petrograd Soviet. Moreover, those units of which the government was more confident, for example, Cossack forces and front soldiers who had been rushed to Petrograd following the July days, either affirmed their neutrality in the struggle now developing over disposition of the garrison between the Petrograd Soviet and military authorities, or sided openly with the Soviet. Typical of the avalanche of anti-government resolutions adopted by garrison units at the time was one passed at a mass protest meeting of soldiers from the Egersky Guards Regiment on October 12th. It affirmed, The pulling out of the revolutionary garrison from Petrograd is needed only by the privileged bourgeoisie as a means of stifling the revolution, dispersing the Congress of Soviets, and subverting the convocation of the Constituent Assembly. As long as governmental power remains in the hands of obvious counter-revolutionaries, Kornilovites and Semi-Kornilovites, we will carry on a firm struggle against the transfer of the revolutionary garrison from Petrograd, the center of the revolution. We declare to all to who we declare to all who listen that, while refusing to leave Petrograd, we will nonetheless heed the voice of the genuine leaders of the workers and poorer peasantry that is, the Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies. We will believe in and follow it because everything else is pure treachery and open mockery of the world revolution. In the foregoing resolution, the soldiers of the Egersky Regiment underlined their loyalty and support for the Soviet, rather than the Bolsheviks or any other single political party. This attitude, which as mentioned earlier, had been observed by local Bolshevik leaders was expressed in many of the political statements adopted by worker, soldier, and sailor organizations at this time. It was vividly reflected, for instance, at a mass meeting of personnel from the Petrograd-based 2nd Baltic Fleet Detachment on October 19th, called in the wake of persistent rumors that the Bolsheviks were organizing an armed uprising to take place the next day. The government commissar in the unit, Krasnovsky, opened the meeting by reading an appeal for patience and order from the day's Izvestia. Subsequently, August Luce, a military clerk who was not formally affiliated with any political party, but whose revolutionary credentials are established by the fact that he was a member of the Centrobalt delegation imprisoned following the July uprising also called on the sailors to refrain from coming out in the near future because such action before elections to the Constituent Assembly might damage the support which left parties now enjoy among a broad segment of the population. At this point, a Bolshevik, Nikolai Nevorovsky, took the floor and upon identifying himself as a Kronstadt sailor, was greeted by loud applause. Nevorovsky berated Krasnovsky for citing Izvestia, which, he claimed, had outlived its time and did little to defend the interests of the laboring classes. Nonetheless, Nevorovsky also argued that it was necessary to refrain from any coming out. Next, the chairman of the unit sailor committee, Vol Volodin, one guess as a Bolshevik as well, spoke up to say he had information regarding a coming out of 30,000 workers whose patience with the provisional government has reached the limit. Volodin expressed hope that the men of the 2nd Baltic Fleet Detachment would not confine themselves merely to the passage of resolutions. Yet this is precisely what the sailors did. Um, the meeting ended with the adoption of a formal statement specifically repudiating separate disorganized armed action but at the same time declaring the readiness of the sailors to come out if such action was specifically sanctioned by the Petrograd Soviet. The resolution concluded, as ardent enemies of the coalition provisional government who believe the policies of this government to be disastrous for democracy, we await with great impatience the portentous opening of the Congress of Representatives of the Soviets of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, in which we have faith and which we invite to take power. 
We propose that it create an organ which will give the people bread and arrange a peace based on the principles proclaimed by the laboring democracy. The new crisis involving the garrison, which surfaced publicly on Monday, October 9th, did not reach its peak until the following week. Throughout this time, the Bolsheviks exploited it to the fullest. In the press, in the Petrograd Soviet, and most importantly in factories and barracks, the Bolsheviks trumpeted the slogan, the All-Russian Congress is in danger, manning fears of a second Kornilov affair. Thus, on October 11th, the lead editorial in Rabachi Put ridiculed the argument that garrison forces were being ordered out of Petrograd for strategic reasons, contending that ostensibly the offensive of June 18th had been organized in the name of strategic necessity, yet leader leading SRs and Mensheviks had openly acknowledged that the offensive was initiated for political reasons, in order to take the army in hand. The same pattern Rabachi put implied had been repeated in August. The Kornilov reforms, capital punishment, and the suppression of army organizations had been justified by the need to raise the fighting capacity of the army to combat the foreign enemy. Yet later it became clear to everyone that all of Kornilov's strategy had been aimed at fighting the revolution. Before the Kornilov uprising, the conspirators demanded the transfer of a whole group of regiments from Petrograd, for strategic necessity, of course. The Bolsheviks had told soldiers, you are being destroyed, but the soldiers still trusted the SR and Menshevik windbags. They left to dig trenches and the revolution nearly fell into the pit being dug for it by Kornilov. The government attempted to counter these arguments by presenting the dangers of a German attack in, every more, in ever more alarming terms. Um, I lost my spot. Among the most important allies the government could look to in its conflict with the garrison were embittered front soldiers impatient to move to the rear and front committees, many of them still in the hands of moderates. Consequently, military authorities attempted to employ pressure from army front committees to force garrison regiments to accept transfer. On October 14th, major garrison regiments received urgent telegrams from the headquarters of the Petrograd Military District, endorsed by General Cheremisov, ordering them to select delegates for a conference with front commanders and representatives of front army committees to be held at Northern Front Headquarters in Peskov the next day. The purpose of this meeting was to brief garrison units on the conditions necessitating their withdrawal from the capital and to acquaint them with the attitudes of Front Army organizations on this question. During these same days, front pressure on the garrison was exerted through the government and the moderate socialist press, which published numerous resolutions and letters from front committees demanding that garrison regiments do their revolutionary duty. Thus, on October 17th, Golo Soldata printed it in full on its front page, a strongly worded resolution passed by the Executive Committee of the 12th Army Soviet of Soldiers, Deputies. The resolution declared that only by helping to defend the front could garrison regiments save the revolutionary capital, and it concluded with a demand for submission to revolutionary duty and unqualified sacrifice so that brothers in the trenches would not be destroyed. An analogous declaration dispatched by the Soldiers' Committee of the First Army, which appeared in Golos Soldata two days later, was even more emphatic. It bitterly attacked soldiers in the rear for having allowed liberty to deteriorate into anarchy and revolution into pogroms, pogroms and expressed full readiness to make garrison units move to the front by force of arms if they were unwilling to do so voluntarily. In his memoirs, Wojtynski suggests that by this time the gap in outlook between the radicalized, peace-hungry soldiers in the trenches and the more moderate, defensist front committees was so great that perhaps only on the issue of front troops being replaced by soldiers from the rear were the two in agreement. Nonetheless, for the Bolsheviks, the apparent resentment of trench soldiers toward troops in the rear, which emerged over the issue of transfers, was a matter of considerable concern 
serving to increase the possibility that, as in July, front, uni front units might be mobilized successfully by Kerensky to pacify the capital. That the, polic that the policies of Bolshevik leaders in the Petrograd Soviet were fully attuned to this danger is yet another sign of the degree to which the Bolsheviks were sensitive to and in their overall behavior very much influenced by the prevailing mass mood. On October 15th, the Bolshevik leadership in the Petrograd Soviet arranged an early morning meeting of garrison representatives. Des designated to go to Pskov. The purpose of this gathering was to formulate a common response to the demands of the front committees. In this connection, the representatives readily accepted the argument of the Bolsheviks that inasmuch as the question of garrison transfers was a central political issue, the resolution of which was the prerogative of the Executive Committee of the Petrograd Soviet, the dispatch of representatives to Pskov should be delayed pending its review. Army committees on the Northern Front responded to this temporary rebuff with a declaration that only a joint conference of front and garrison representatives, and not the Petrograd Soviet or garrison alone, had the right to decide the legitimacy of transfers. The Front Declaration demanded that representatives of the garrison rep uh, present themselves for such a conference on October 17th. Meanwhile, the Petrograd Soviet Executive Committee hurriedly considered the question of what to do about the demand for a conference in Pskov. Ultimately, it authorized dispatch of a delegation, but drastically altered its character and composition. As provided for by the Executive Committee, the delegation of garrison representatives was to be expanded by the addition of an ever larger contingent of Soviet deputies who shared the point of view of the Petrograd Soviet in regard to Petrograd's revolutionary defense. A plenary session of the Petrograd Soviet on October 16th endorsed this procedure, stipulating that, de that the delegation was empowered only to gather and exchange information. Of course, the Petrograd Soviet's action effectively destroyed any possibility that the Pskov Conference would work to the advantage of the provisional government. Convened on the afternoon of October 17th, it acted as a sounding board for differing points of view, but nothing more. Cheremisov and his fellow officers, surrounded by battle maps, outlined the military situation on the Northern Front and in the Baltic. Wojtynski contends that Cheremisov spoke without enthusiasm, conveying the distinct impression that at bottom it made no difference to him whether or not Petrograd regiments moved to the front, and that he did not wish to become involved in the matter. A succession of embittered front representatives described graphically the impossible situation of the front soldiers and the latter's resentment of garrison troops, whom they believed to be lounging comfortably in the rear, unwilling to support the common defense effort. In response, the Petrograd delegation pointed to the purported sacrifices already made by most garrison soldiers in the interests of the revolution and of Russia's defense. To Wojtynski's frustration, the subsequent discussion was concerned as much with the need for transfer of power to the Soviets, for peace, and for the long-suffering frontline soldier to return home, as it was with the question of getting new regiments into the trenches. Toward the close of the meeting, the Bolshevik military organization leader and chairman of the military section of the Petrograd Soviet, Andrei Sadovsky, who had played a prominent role in the writing of Order No. 1 at the time of the February Revolution, read a formal statement on behalf of the Petrograd delegation. Composed by Sverdlov, the message voiced the left's apprehension that counter-revolutionary motives were behind efforts to withdraw the garrison. For his part, Wojtynski sought to obtain a pledge from the visitors that they would work to obtain the garrison's voluntary compliance with requests for troop support. Leaning on their limited mandate, the delegates from Petrograd refused to enter into such an agreement and even demurred from endorsing an oral resume of their discussion. 
Actually, mistrust of the provisional government's intentions at this time was so widespread that even the moderate socialists were forced to recognize that garrison troops could not be expected to respond to relocation orders, not in some way controlled by the Petrograd Soviet. On the morning of October 9th, not long after Cheremisov's directive to the garrison became public, the executive committee of the Petrograd Soviet considered the question of the capital's military defense and the suspicions of garrison troops in regard to the government's motives. At least by implication, all of the participants in this discussion acknowledged that the fears of the soldiers were justified. The Menshevik Mark Broido put before the deputies a joint Menshevik SR resolution, which, while calling on garrison soldiers to begin preparations for movement to the front, at the same time sought to calm them by providing for the creation of a special committee to evaluate defense needs and to prepare military defense plans that would inspire popular confidence. At bottom, the intent of the resolution was to, was to facilitate cooperation between the Petrograd Soviet and the government in the interest of the war effort. The Bolsheviks countered this proposal with a significantly more military militant one, hastily scratched out by Trotsky, repudiating the Kerensky government as the ruination of the country and proclaiming that Russia's sole hope of salvation lay in immediate peace. The resolution embodying this proposal accused the bourgeoisie, along with Kerensky, of preparing to turn over Petrograd, the main fortress of the revolution, to the Germans. Affirming that the Petrograd Soviet could in no way take responsibility for the government's military strategy, and in particular, the withdrawal of troops from Petrograd, it insisted that the way to assure survival was to transfer power to the Soviets. Like the moderate socialist resolution, the Bolshevik proposal called on the garrison to come to battle readiness. Even now, popular determination to resist the foreign foe was too strong for the Bolsheviks to ignore completely. By, implica by implication, however, these preparations were intended as much to defend the, re the revolution from the government and the right as from the Germans. The Bolshevik resolution specifically provided for the creation of a revolutionary defense committee, the future military revolutionary committee, the primary purpose of which was to become fully familiar with all information relating to the defense of the capital and to take all possible steps to arm workers in order to facilitate the revolutionary defense of Petrograd and the safety of the people from the attacks being openly prepared by military and civil Kornilovites. The proposed committee appeared to be modeled after the Committee for Struggle Against the Counter-Revolution organized by the Soviet leadership at the time of the Kornilov affair. Yet there was a fundamental difference between the two institutions. While the Defense Committee established in late August had been formally committed to the protection of the provisional government against the onslaught of the counter-revolution, for the committee proposed by the Bolsheviks, one of the main enemies was the provisional government itself. The surprising thing about the October 9th vote on the Menshevik SR and Bolshevik resolutions in the Petrograd Soviet Executive Committee, now commonly assumed to be completely controlled by the Bolsheviks, was that the Menshevik SR resolution was passed. A narrow majority of deputies present were evidently sympathetic to the moderates' argument that the Bolshevik resolution, by creating an independent military headquarters alongside that of the government, would severely cripple defense efforts. However, both resolutions were subsequently put before an unusually crowded and lively plenary session of the Petrograd Soviet late the same evening. A reporter later commented that the mood of the meeting was reminiscent of the first days of the revolution. Here, the militant Bolshevik motion clearly struck the more responsive chord, receiving the support of an overwhelming majority of factory and barrack, barracks representatives. Such, in brief, was the original conception of the Military Revolutionary Committee. The institution used by the Bolsheviks in the following days to subvert and overthrow the provisional government. Histories of the October Revolution written in the Soviet Union in Stalin's time conveyed the impression that the creation of the Military Revolutionary Committee was a direct result of the Bolshevik Central Committee's decision of October 10th 
to organize an armed uprising, and that from the outset, the organization of an insurrection was the committee's primary purpose. Indeed, this view was implicit, even in the valuable three-volume collection of documents concerning the Military Revolutionary Committee published by the Soviet Academy of Sciences in the mid-1960s. This interpretation is obviously misleading. At no time during the first half of October was the question of forming a non-party institution like the Military Revolutionary Committee ever raised in the Central Committee. Indeed, the Military Revolutionary Committee was conceived on October 9th, that is, the day before the Central Committee's decision regarding preparation of an uprising. An organizational plan for the Military Revolutionary Committee was considered by leaders of the military section of the Petrograd Soviet on October 11th. This plan was overwhelmingly endorsed at meetings of the Executive Committee of the Petrograd Soviet on October 12th and the Soldiers' sec Section on October 13th and it was officially ratified by the full Petrograd Soviet on the night of October 16th, at the same session that endorsed the Executive Committee's plans for the Beskov Conference. As the organizational plan for the Military Revolutionary Committee emerged on October 16th, it provided for the creation of a committee to determine the minimum military force required in Petrograd itself, and hence not available for transfer. To make a precise accounting of all garrison personnel and reserves of provisions and weapons and to formulate a working plan for the defense of the capital. The enabling act which set up the Military Revolutionary Committee also provided for the creation of a garrison conference, primarily an assembly of representatives from all units of the garrison, which would meet on a regular basis to facilitate communications between the Military Revolutionary Committee and the garrison and among the individual regiments themselves. It is worthy of note that this plan was significantly less provocative than the proposal that had been first rejected by the Executive Committee and later adopted by the full Petrograd Soviet on October 9th. The plan adopted on October 16th said nothing about arming workers or about defense against internal as well as external threats to the revolution. <laughs> My cat makes weird noises. To be sure, this was in part the result of practical parliamentary considerations. Still, there is no reason to doubt that, initially, even most Bolsheviks viewed the new committee's chief purpose as the prevention of government attempts to ship or sorry, to ship the Bolshevized Petrograd garrison to the front, and in general the defense of the left from attack, rather than the overthrow of the government. As we have seen during these days, Lenin and other Bolshevik militants looked not to the Petrograd Soviet, but to the Bolshevik military organization and the Northern Region Congress of Soviets to organize an insurrection. Not until after the Northern Congress had ended, at the time of the October 15th and 16th party strategy sessions, when the crucial importance of tying any moves against the government prior to the Congress of Soviets to the defense of the Soviets and the Congress was perceived, did party leaders begin to look at the Military Revolutionary Committee as something more than an organ of mutual self-defense. Relevant in this respect is the fact that at the October 15th Petersburg Committee meeting, local party leaders were uncertain of how the Military Revolutionary Committee just then taking shape related to their own planning for an insurrection. Latsis merely took note of the committee's creation and pointed to the necessity of determining an official attitude toward it. The Petersburg Committee considered simply dispatching representatives to the Milita Military Revolutionary Committee, but concluded by agreeing to seek a clarification of the latter's status from the Central Committee before doing so. The Central Committee, at its meeting on October 16th, after reconfirming the October 10th decision, selected a Military Revolutionary Center composed of Sverdlov, Stalin, Bubnov, Oritsky and Zerzinski. It then specified that the center was to become part of the Soviet Revolutionary Committee, thereby suggesting for the first time the possibility that the Military Revolutionary Committee might become the directing body for the seizure of power. Not until October 20th, however, did the, mil did the Military Revolutionary Committee hold an organizational meeting. At this time, it selected a five-man leadership bureau composed of three Bolsheviks. Antonov, Podvoisky, and Sadovsky, 
and two left SRs, Lazimir and Su Sukurkov. Before this, it had been conceivable that the Mensheviks and SRs might be prominently represented in the committee. Hence, it was only after the actual composition and leadership of the Military Revolutionary Committee became clear that the Bolshevik strategists could fully relate it to their own planning with any degree of confidence. Significantly, between October 9th and 22nd, the formation and initial activities of the Military Revolutionary Committee, which were major news topics in all other newspapers, including Rabachi Put, were virtually ignored in Soldat, reflecting the fact that the leadership of the military organization was still jealously guarding its primacy in matters relating to the garrison. On October 19th or 20th, the military organization sent a memorandum to the Central Committee. Its text has not been published, evidently insisting on the critical importance of leaving the direction of an armed uprising in the hands of the military organization rather than regular party organs or the Petrograd Soviet. On October 20th, however, most likely after the first organizational session of the Military Revolutionary Committee, the Central Committee rejected the military organization's arguments asserting that all Bolshevik organizations can become part of the Revolutionary Center organized by the Petrograd Soviet and discuss within the Bolshevik fraction all questions which concern them. It is important to note that by this time, Lenin had also come to see the potential importance of the Military Revolutionary Committee as an ostensibly non-party insurrectionary organ, although in contrast to Trotsky and many other top party strategists, he remained absolutely adamant on the need to seize power by means of an armed uprising, and equally important, to do so before the Second Congress of Soviets, which on October 18th had been rescheduled to open on October 25th. Late one evening, late one evening probably between October 20th and 23rd, at Lenin's insistence, the chiefs of the military organization, Podvoisky and Nevsky, along with Antonov, as head of the executive committee created by the Northern Region Congress of Soviets, were summoned from Smolny to a small number in the Vyberg district for an urgent consultation. To a small apartment in the Vyberg district for an urgent consultation. To judge by the recollections of this meeting by Podvoisky, Nevsky, and Antonov, at this point, the military organization leadership, like Lenin, still tended to envision the seizure of power primarily in military terms, that is, as a properly organized armed uprising against the existing government. But Voisky attempted to obtain Lenin's endorsement of the military organization's primacy in preparations for the overthrow of the provisional government, but to no avail. Rather, echoing the earlier decision of the Central Committee, Lenin insisted not only that the military organization work through the Military Revolutionary Committee, but that it not attempt to dictate the latter's policies, that the membership of the Military Revolutionary Committee be made as broad as possible, and that individual initiatives be encouraged, as long as they were consistent with the party's objectives. According to Nevsky, Lenin's chief purpose in calling this meeting was to eradicate the last vestiges of stubbornness within the military organization in regard to an uprising. For even now, military organization leaders were divided and on the whole pessimistic about the wisdom of initiating an insurrection without significant further preparation. At this late night confrontation within with Lenin, Antonov reported on the revolutionary situation in Finland, observing that the artillerists in Sveberg were still under the influence of Mensheviks and SRs and that the political attitudes of Cuban Cossacks stationed in Finland were cause for concern. In regard to the assistance that the Bolsheviks could expect from revolutionary elements in the Baltic region, Antonov expressed certainty that the fleet would respond positively to a call for an insurrection. He minimized the significance of the actual immediate military support that could be counted upon from the sailors, However, warning that the depth of the channels would be prohibitive, that sailors on the more radical big ships would be fearful of submarines and cruisers, and finally that the sailors would be unwilling to expose the front, 
To this Lenin retorted, the sailors must understand that the revolution is in greater danger in Petrograd than on the Baltic, responded Antonov. They don't understand. The most I can guarantee are two or three gunboats to be brought up to the Neva, or brought up the Neva, and a defensive detachment of 3,000 or so soldiers and workers from Vyberg. Not enough, growled Lenin. When it was their turn to report, both Nevsky and Podois Podvoisky argued for a delay of 10 to 15 days in the start of an uprising. Nevsky re-emphasized the difficulty of moving radicalized elements of the fleet to the capital in time to be of any use. Well, while Podvoisky pleaded for further time to coordinate preparations for an insurrection at the front and in provisional or and in provincial garrisons. As far as Podvoisky was concerned, time was on the Bolsheviks' side, and the danger lay in premature action. To all these reservations, Lenin turned a deaf ear. Podvoisky remembered that he became restless and impatient at the very mention of delay. Time is on the side of the government, not the Bolsheviks, Lenin argued. Waiting would only give the government more time to destroy the Bolsheviks with loyal troops brought in from the front. Over and over, Lenin reiterated the absolute necessity of overthrowing the provisional government before the Congress of Soviets, so that the Congress, irrespective of its composition, would be confronted with a situation in which the seizure of power by the workers is an actual fact. Antonov recalled that he and Nevsky were greatly influenced by Lenin's arguments, but that Podvoisky remained skeptical. At any rate, their discussion ended with the military organization leaders agreeing to work within the Military Revolutionary Committee and, in general, to intensify their preparation to maximum degree. Meanwhile, both the Military Revolutionary Committee and the Garrison Conference, which had been approved formally by the Petrograd Soviet on October 16th, had begun to function. The Garrison Conference was the first of the two to start operations. Representatives of most major military units in Petrograd and its suburbs responding positively to requests from the, from the military section of the Petrograd Soviet to send delegates to Smolny for the conference's first session on October 18th. The main purpose of this initial gathering was to obtain a clearer sense of the extent to which individual units would go in supporting the Petrograd Soviet, and in particular, in opposing the government on the issue of withdrawing the bulk of the garrison from the capital. Each of the assembled representatives characterized the political position of his unit and specifically its attitude toward taking arms against the provisional government. From the government's point of view, the results of this informal sounding capturing the leftward swing among the soldiers caused by the threat of shipment to the front were thoroughly disquieting. All but three of the 18 representatives whose reports were recorded proclaimed lack of confidence in the provisional government and firm support for transfer of power to the Soviets. At the same time, these reports were not wholly reassuring to the Bolsheviks. Roughly half the spokesmen affirming support for a Soviet government were non-committal in regard to armed action while the remainder either directly or implicitly made it clear that they would countenance a coming out only if it were organized by the Petrograd Soviet, or in one case, the All-Russian Congress of Soviets. Said the representative of the Igursky Guards Regiment, we would support an uprising only in response to an order from the Petrograd Soviet, but in such a case we would take action in an organized way and would demand the immediate overthrow of the government and transfer of power to the Soviets. In the wake of this meeting, Mensheviks and SRs in the Central Executive Committee were fully alert to the danger that the Bolsheviks might successfully exploit the crisis over the garrison to mobilize soldiers for an insurrection. Seeking to dissuade the troops from such a course, they arranged an independent gathering of garrison representatives for the following day. In addition to spokesmen for Petrograd-based units, they invited to this meeting moderately inclined military personnel supposedly representing army committees from the front. 
Yet despite such maneuvering, this gathering proved no less alarming to government supporters than the preceding one. Early in the session, Dan appealed to the soldiers to devote their energies to preparations for the Constituent Assembly and to organize for the struggle against the Germans, the counter-revolution, and insurrection of any kind. But as it happened, the audience was distinctly more receptive to Trotsky's argument that the most effective way of supporting the, con the Constituent Assembly was to bring about transfer of power to the Soviets. The Soviets would then ensure that the broad masses of soldiers, rather than the more conciliatory army committees, would be strongly represented in the Constituent Assembly. A succession of garrison representatives jumped up to affirm faith in the Petrograd Soviet and willingness to act in its behalf. Indeed, even the supposedly loyalist visitors from the front combined expressions of opposition to an armed uprising and the prevailing circumstances with enthusiastic declarations of support for a transfer of power to the Soviets, an immediate armistice and land for the peasants. The meeting's sponsors were dealt a further blow when a majority agreed not to vote on any formal resolutions since they had been called together by the Central Executive Committee without approval from the Petrograd Soviet. The Military Revolutionary Committee took concrete shape between October 16th and 21st, Included among its members, which until the overthrow of the provisional government probably numbered no more than a few dozen, were Bolsheviks, left SRs, and a few anarchists. The Mensheviks had completely washed their hands of the committee at the start, as well as delegates from the Petrograd Soviet, the Soviet of Peasants Deputies, Centrobalt, the Regional Executive Committee of the Army, Fleet, and Workers in Finland, Factory Shop Committees, and Trade Unions. As noted earlier, at the outset, a military revolutionary committee bureau made up of Bolsheviks and left SRs was formed to help direct the committee's day-to-day -day work. With Bolshevik approval, the formal chairman of the bureau and of the military revolutionary committee as a whole was a left SR, Pavel Lazmir a senior military medical aide and chairman of the soldiers section of the Petrograd Soviet. This furthered the committee's ostensibly non-party character. However, during the most critical days of the October Revolution in Petrograd, that is, between October 21st and 25th, Podvoisky, Antonov, Avzinko, and Trotsky acted in the capacity of military revolutionary committee chairman, almost as often as did Lazmir. From its inception, the Military Revolutionary Committee was housed in a few rooms, always crowded and bustling. On the third floor of Smolny, here leftist on the third floor of Smolny. Here leftist leaders in constantly changing numbers discussed late breaking developments. The committee as a whole met rarely, and at the most critical moments, the committee's tactics were evidently determined by whichever members happened to be on the scene acting in accordance with their varying perceptions of the, prevail of the prevailing situation. And their views... Oh, fucking cat's an idiot. And their views... I lost my spot. With their varying perceptions of the prevailing situation and their views on the development of the revolution in general. In part because of the great preponderance of Bolsheviks in the Military Revolutionary Committee, Western historians have tended to view the organ as merely a front organization closely controlled by the Bolshevik Central Committee or the military organization. Yet such an assessment is inaccurate. Bolsheviks played the leading, the leading role within the committee. However, they were not its only active members, and even the Bolshevik participants were by no means united in their conception of the committee's tasks. Further, the published record of the Central Committee's activities uh, during these days reveals that at its meetings, scant attention was paid to the operations of the Military Revolutionary Committee. The Central Committee now devoted most of its time to internal party matters, such as the appropriate action to be taken against Kemenev and Zinoviev, and the formulation of 
positions for the coming Congress of Soviets. For its part, at least until the culmination of the seizure of power, the leadership of the military organization abided by the Central Committee's ruling of October 20th and worked within the Military Revolutionary Committee's outwardly non-party institutional framework. At its first organizational meeting on October 20th, the Military Revolutionary Committee seems to have been concerned, above all, with strengthening the defenses, the defenses of the Petrograd Soviet against attack and further solidifying its status among units of the garrison. Members of the committee were particularly uneasy at this point about possible trouble on Sunday, October 22nd. That date had been formally designated by the Petrograd Soviet leadership as Petrograd Soviet Day, a time for concerts and speech making, intended originally to raise funds for the Soviet and, more recently, as yet another opportunity to gauge mass support for the Petrograd Soviet's radical political program. However, October 22nd also happened to be the 105th anniversary of Moscow's liberation from Napoleon. In celebration of that event, the Soviet of the Union of Cossack Military Forces announced plans for a midday religious procession. Leftist leaders were fe fearful, with apparent justification, that in the inflamed atmosphere, the Cossack march might be utilized by the extreme right to provoke an armed clash. As it turned out, at the 11th hour, the Cossacks cancelled their procession. But on October 20th, one of the Military Revolutionary Committee's first actions was to dispatch representatives to key combat units and weapons depots as a precaution against possible, possible counter-revolutionary moves. Before adjourning on October 20th, the Military Revolutionary Committee scheduled another session of the Garrison Conference for the following morning. At this gathering and at others on October 22nd and 23rd, firm links were forged between the newly created Military Revolutionary Committee and individual Garrison units. The October 21st Garrison Conference session opened with a rousing speech by Trotsky, who in an evident reference to the Cossack religious march, warned of approaching threatening events, and appealed to workers and soldiers to rally around the Petrograd Soviet to support the Military Revolutionary Committee and to aid the Soviets in the struggle for power. An observer for the Menshevik SR organ, Golos Soldata, captured the audience's response. After Trotsky's speech, a whole series of people spoke out in regard to the necessity of immediately transferring power to the Soviets. Moreover, the auditorium became so electrified that when the soldier Goldberg appeared on the tribune to say that the subject under discussion was not fully clear to the audience, not only did the assembly break out in shouts of away and go to hell, it completely prevented the speaker from explaining what he had in mind. The representative of the 4th Don Cossack Regiment informed the assembly that his regimental committee had decided against participation in the next day's religious procession. The representative of the 14th Don Cossack Regiment caused a sensation when he declared that his regiment not only would not support counter-revolutionary moves, irrespective of whence they came, but would fight the counter-revolution with all its strength. In this sense, he said, I shake hands with my comrade Cossack from the 4th Don Cossack Regiment. At this, the orator bent down and shook hands with the Cossack from the 4th Regiment. And in response, the assembly exploded in a roar of enthusiastic approval and thunderous applause, which did not die down for a long time. The gathering concluded with the passage of resolutions drafted by Trotsky relating to the Military Revolutionary Committee, Petrograd Soviet Day, and the tasks of the All-Russian Congress of Soviets. Taken together, these resolutions illustrate both the increased aggressiveness of the Petrograd garrison under the threat of shipment to the front, and the committee's strategy of utilizing the defense of the revolution to mobilize support for the Petrograd Soviet, <coughs> and the seizure of power. The resolution on the Military Revolutionary Committee passed by the garrison conference on October 21st hailed the committee's birth and promised it full support in all steps aimed at tying the front more closely to the rear in the interests of the, re of the revolution. 
The resolution dealing with Petrograd's Soviet day warned brother Cossacks against being victimized by the enemies of the revolution and invited them to participate instead in the, in the rallies planned by the left. At the same time, it warned that any attempts by Kornilovites and the bourgeoisie to inject confusion and dissension into the ranks of the revolution would be met with a merciless rebuff. Finally, in its resolution on the Congress of Soviets, the Garrison Conference endorsed all the political decisions of the Petrograd Soviet, called on the coming All-Russian Congress to take power in its hands and provide peace, land, and bread for the people, and pledged all the resources at the command of the Garrison to the fulfillment of these demands. But tryst by these assurances of support, the Military Revolutionary Committee now embarked on a decisive confrontation with the government, over ultimate control of the garrison. First, <coughs> first, it began dispatching its own commissars to replace those supporting the government in all units of the garrison and in all weapons and munitions depots. Then, late on the night of October 21st, it sent a group of representatives, including Lazmir Sadovsky and Mekonoshin, to General Staff Headquarters to formally assert the committee's claim to prior command authority over garrison units. Arriving around midnight, the group was ushered into General Polkovnikov's office. Sadovsky came straight to the point. Henceforth, he proclaimed, orders not signed by us are invalid. Polkovnikov retorted that the garrison was his responsibility. Referring to the commissar from the Central Executive Committee already working with him, he added, We know only the commissar of the Central Executive Committee. We won't recognize your commissars. If they break the law, we will arrest them. At this, the group returned to Smolny. Re returning to Military Revolutionary Committee headquarters, Lazmir Sadovsky and Mekonoshin rounded up Antonov, Sverdlov, and Trotsky, Together, they mapped out plans to exploit the Petrograd military district's uncooperative stance. Most importantly, Trotsky drafted for endorsement by the Garrison Conference in circulation to all units later in the day what was to become one of the seminal documents of the October Revolution in Petrograd, a formal declaration that amounted to a categorical repudiation of the provisional government's authority over Garrison troops wrote Trotsky. At a meeting on October 21st, the Revolutionary Garrison united around the Military Revolutionary Committee as its directing organ. Despite this, on the night of October 21st to 22nd, the headquarters of the Petrograd Military District refused to recognize the Military Revolutionary Committee. Rejecting work in association with the representatives of the soldiers' section of the Petrograd Soviet. In so doing, the headquarters The headquarters breaks with the revolutionary garrison and the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers deputies. The headquarters becomes a direct weapon of counter-revolutionary forces. The protection of revolutionary order from counter-revolutionary attacks rests with the revolutionary soldiers direction by the Military Revolutionary Committee. No directives to the garrison not signed by the Military Revolutionary Committee should be considered valid. The revolution is in danger. Long live the revolutionary garrison. A few years later, Trotsky mused aloud about whether Lazimir, in cooperating in the work of the Military Revolutionary Committee, recognized that he was taking part in a conscious plan to overthrow the provisional government, or whether his outlook simply reflected the formless revolutionary spirit of the left SRs. Trotsky concluded the latter to be the case, and this may indeed be true. There is little doubt, however, that in the minds of Sadovsky, Mekonoshin, Sverdlov, and of course Trotsky himself, the politics of the, of the Military Revolutionary Committee were part of a conscious, gradual subversion of the government. Largely because of current political considerations, most historians in the Soviet Union consider the October insurrection to have begun sometime on October 24th. Yet this interpretation ignores the crucial significance of the steps taken by the Military Revolutionary Committee on October 21st to 22nd. To cite the knowledgeable contemporary Czech specialist on the Russian Revolution, Michael Raymond, already on October 21st and 22nd, the Military Revolutionary Committee, in effect, 
took upon itself authority over the garrison. Its actions from both a practical and a jur juridical standpoint would be considered by any nation a clear case of mutiny and insurrection. On Sunday, October 22nd, Petrograd Soviet Day, the Bolsheviks' most popular orators, Trotsky, Volodarsky, Lashevich, Kalantai, Raskolnikov, and Krylenko among them, took to the stump at mass political rallies in factories and public meeting halls throughout the capital. Even Kamenev participated prominently in the speech making, ignoring the Central Committee's specific ban on speaking out publicly counter to its decisions. He made use of this opportunity to ridicule once again the possibility of the party's involvement in an insurrection before the Congress of Soviets. Typical of the highly successful rallies staged on behalf of the Petrograd Soviet on October 22nd was one held in the House of the People, on the right bank of the Neva. Well before the start of the program, a massive crowd of factory workers, soldiers, and a smattering of lower middle class townspeople filled the colossal opera house, primarily to see and hear the legendary Trotsky, the featured speaker. Trotsky's address contained little not already repeated by the Bolsheviks ad infinitum, warning that Petrograd was on the verge of being surrendered to the Germans. He proclaimed that the workers and soldiers themselves would take responsibility for defending the approaches to the capital. The revolutionary fire kindled by the new government to be selected by the Congress of Soviets, he went on to say, would be so intense as to engulf not only all Russia, but the entire world. And having taken power, the Soviet would bring immediate peace. It would also eliminate private property, confiscating grain hidden away by large landowners and excess money, clothing and footwear in the hands of the bourgeoisie. And disturbing land to the peasants as well as money, or distributing land to the peasants as well as money, bread, clothing, and footwear to all those in need. Perhaps because of the apparent imminence of these shattering developments, or as a result of Trotsky's oratorical skill, or a combination of both, the audience was unusually stimulated by his words. A reporter for Rec, who was on the scene, observed with consternation that after Trotsky asked for a pledge of support to the Soviet when it moved from word to deeds, or words to deeds, the huge audience threw up its hands and chanted, We swear it. Another of Trotsky's listeners was Sukhanov, who subsequently recorded. All around me was a mood bordering on ecstasy. It seemed as if the crowd spontaneously and of its own accord would break into some religious hymn. Trotsky formulated a brief and general resolution. Who, who was for? Who was it for? The crowd of thousands, as one man, raised its hands. Trotsky went on speaking. The innumerable crowd continued to hold up its hands. Trotsky rapped out the words. Let this vote of yours be your vow, with all your strength and at any sacrifice to support the Soviet, that has taken on itself the glorious burden of bringing the victory of the revolution to a conclusion, and of giving land, bread, and peace. The vast crowd was holding up its hands. It agreed. It vowed. These... Uh, while these rallies were in progress, military officials launched efforts to deal with the Military Revolutionary Committee. In the early morning hours, General Polkovnik Pol fuck, Polkovnikov <laughs> invited representatives of garrison, regimental, and brigade committees, as well as officials of the All-Russian Executive Committees in the Petrograd Soviet, to an immediate meeting at General Staff Headquarters obviously with an eye toward applying pressure on the Military Revolutionary Committee to back off from its insistence on veto power over the regular military command. Even before Pokolnikov's meeting got underway, however, a hastily convened session of the garrison conference at Smolny voted formally to endorse Trotsky's declaration of the preceding night. Shortly afterward, an invitation was received from Pokolnikov to send representatives to the meeting at General Staff Headquarters. In response, a garrison conference delegation headed by Dushkevich put in a brief appearance at the meeting. On the garrison conference's behalf, Dushkevich, Dushkevich, fuck, that's a terrible fucking name to pronounce, Dushkevich at once reasserted that henceforth all the military command's directives had to be 
countersigned by the Military Revolutionary Committee. <coughs> the delegation then departed. Indicative of the weakness of the Petrograd military district in the prevailing situation was the fact that Polkovnikov reacted to this demarche with a fresh effort to settle the conflict over authority and the garrison peacefully. He now issued an invitation to the Military Revolutionary Committee to meet with him the next day for the purpose of discussing Soviet representation at headquarters. On and off through the day and night of October 22nd to 23rd, Kerensky conferred with his chief advisors in regard to the developing crisis. From all parts of the city came reports of the massive public support for the left exhibited at the huge rallies organized by the Bolsheviks. This on top of the news of the Military Revolutionary Committee's direct challenge to the government's authority in the garrison. <coughs> in the early evening, the Petrograd Military District Chief of Staff, General Yakov Bagratuni, requested Army Headquarters on the Northern Front to prepare an infantry brigade, a cavalry regiment, and an artillery battery for rapid shipment to the capital. Wojtynski responded from the Northern Front that readying these detachments in advance without knowledge of the purposes for which they were to be used was out of the question. One must suppose because the soldiers would become suspicious and resist such a step. Somewhat later, Kerensky dispatched an urgent appeal to General Karamasov to come to Petrograd, presumably to discuss the problem of getting loyalist troops to the capital in a hurry. Moreover, to his fellow ministers, Kerensky proposed dispatching available forces to arrest members of the Military Revolutionary Committee and to liquidate the committee without further delay. But he was temporarily dissuaded from the course by Polkovnikov. The Petrograd military district commander expressed the hope that in discussions the next day, the Military Revolutionary Committee might be, might be prevailed upon to retract its declaration. The Prime Minister thereupon ordered General Begratuni to present the Soviet with a firm ultimatum. Either it rescind the October 22nd declaration immediately, or military authorities would take whatever steps were necessary to restore law and order. Meanwhile, the process begun by the Military Revolutionary Committee on October 21st of substituting commissars of its own choosing for those of the government throughout the city was intensified. Most of the new commissars were well-known members of the Bolshevik military organization only recently released from jail. Almost everywhere they were greeted with enthusiasm. As the appointment of the new commissars neared completion on October 23rd, the Military Revolutionary Committee issued an order endowing its commissars with unlimited veto power over military orders, thus to some extent making control over operations at district headquarters superfluous. This order, immediately published in the leftist press and circulated throughout the capital, informed the population that in the interest of, def of defense of the revolution and its achievements from encroachments on the part of the counter-revolution, military revolutionary committee commissars had been appointed to military units, and especially important points in the capital and its suburbs, and stipulated that orders and directives sent to these points were to be fulfilled only if confirmed by them. The continuing drastic decline of the provisional government's military position in the capital was also reflected on October 23rd and the Military Revolutionary Committee's winning of the strategically crucial Peter and Paul Fortress and the adjoining Cronwork Arsenal, a central storehouse of arms and munitions. One of the Military Revolutionary Committee's few setbacks in its campaign for authority over the Petrograd garrison had occurred at the fortress on October 19th when committees representing units garrisoned there had passed a resolution opposing a coming out. When the Military Revolutionary Committee sent a commissar to the fortress three days later, it was feared that he might be arrested by hostile soldiers. Particularly worrisome in, connected, in connection with the fortress was the attitude toward the left of several thousand cyclists from the front based there since the July days. The Military Revolutionary Committee, with Trotsky, Podvoisky, Antonov, and Lashevich, among others, in attendance, had considered the problem of the Peter and Paul Fortress initially on October 22nd. 
Antonov subsequently recalls that at that at this discussion, he strongly urged sending some Bolshevized troops from the Pavlovsky regiment to capture the old fortress. However, Trotsky, still concerned with appearances, persuaded the committee to make an attempt to take the fortress from within. <clears throat> it cannot be that the troops there would not be sympathetic to us, Trotsky reportedly declared. In an effort to take the fortress by persuasion, the Military Revolutionary Committee arranged a mass meeting with the cyclist, cyclists and all other soldiers to begin at midday, October 23rd, on the fortress's main square. Lashevich recalls that arriving for this meeting, he found a host of right SR and Menshevik luminaries, as well as the fort commander, on hand to contest the Bolsheviks for the allegiance of the troops. After the meeting had been underway for several hours, with Lashevich and Chernovsky leading the fight for the Military Revolutionary Committee, Trotsky arrived to test his persuasive powers on the soldiers, wrote Lashevich later. During Chudnovsky's speech, there was an abrupt, deafening roar of hurrahs and applause. Chudnovsky peered down from the tribune, trying to catch the cause of the commotion. Suddenly, his face lit up with a pleased smile. I yield my place to Comrade Trotsky, he loudly proclaimed. Trotsky mounted the tribune. Finally, it became still, and there followed not so much a speech as an inspirational song. The mass meeting on the fortress square dragged on long after Trotsky had finished speaking. When it grew dark, the soldiers moved outside the fortress to the nearby Cirque Modern. In the end, most of the soldiers voted to support transfer of power to the Soviets and to, to obey the directives of the Military Revolutionary Committee. As Lashevich remembered, at 8 p.m. in an atmosphere of extreme tension, the question was put to a vote. All those who supported the Military Revolutionary Committee moved to the left, those against to the right. With cries of hurrah, an overwhelming majority rushed to the left. Remaining in opposition to the Military Revolutionary Committee was a small group of officers and intellectuals from among the cyclists. <clears throat> Control of the Peter and Paul Fortress, whose cannon overlooked the Winter Palace, was a victory of immense psychological and strategic importance. Moreover, with the securing of the Cronwork Arsenal, virtually all major weapons stores in the capital were at the disposal of the Military Revolutionary Committee, which now funneled massive stocks of arms and ammunition to its workers. Yet counterbalancing these unexpectedly easy victories was the fact that the left SRs continued stubbornly to resist all moves to de to generate the support of mass organizations for the overthrow of the government before the Congress of Soviets. In addition, late reports on political attitudes at the front were highly contradictory. While a flood of telegrams suggested that the mood of the average front soldier was not much different from that of his garrison counterpart, many front delegates arriving in the capital for the Congress of Soviets gave the impression that if an insurrection were to break out in the capital before the Congress, Many large frontline units would respond to an appeal for help from the Central Executive Committee. Actually, Bolshevik strategists in Petrograd were still not confident of the, of the degree to which they could count on workers and soldiers in the capital to support immediate, direct military action against the government. Nor could they ignore the possibility that an independent, ultra-military course would be resisted by provincial party officials strongly represented in the Bolshevik Congress fraction. Resistance of this sort had already occurred in early summer, when the Bolshevik fraction at the first All-Russian Congress of Soviets helped pressure the Central Committee into aborting the armed demonstration planned for June 10th. At the time of the Sixth Congress, when delegates from outside the capital heaped criticism on the Central Committee for its behavior in connection with the July uprising, and more recently in the aftermath of the Democratic State Conference, when the Bolshevik Conference fraction reversed the Central Committee's narrow decision to boycott the pre-Parliament. On the other hand, there was every hope that if the party waited for the government to attack, whether this occurred before the opening of the Congress or after the Congress's proclamation of a Soviet government, it would be able to count on the support of the left SRs, the soldiers at the front and rear, a united Bolshevik party, 
and a broad front of mass organizations from the Petrograd Soviet to the factory shop committees. Blame for whatever bloodshed ensued would then fall on the Kerensky regime, and the prospects for retention of power by the left would be increased immeasurably. Such a course might well lead to the creation of a socialist coalition government, including moderates, rather than a government of the extreme left alone. It appears that Lenin was one of the very few top Bolshevik leaders to whom the risks of an independent, ultra-radical course were outweighed by impatience to create an exclusively leftist regime at once. Hence, despite its successes, no doubt for the preceding reasons, and others as well, the Military Revolutionary Committee did not cross the Rubicon between moves that could be justified as defensive and steps which would appear to have usurped the prerogatives of the Congress. <clears throat> At a plenary meeting of the Petrograd Soviet the night of October 23rd, Antonov of Cinco, in a major report on the activities of the Military Revolutionary Committee, carefully described and justified each of the committee's early moves as a defense of the revolution, the Congress of Soviets, and the Constituent Assembly. Following his address, an overwhelming number of deputies supported a Bolshevik-sponsored resolution endorsing the measures taken by the Military Revolutionary Committee and whatever steps of a similar character the developing situation might require. <clears throat> the phrasing of the resolution captures the spirit of the tactics still pursued by the left. The Petrograd Soviet considers that due to the energetic work of the Military Revolutionary Committee, the ties of the Petrograd Soviet to the Revolutionary Garrison are strengthened and expresses confidence that only continuation of efforts in the same direction will ensure the possibility of free and unimpeded work by the All-Russian Congress of Soviets now opening. The continuing tactical caution of the Military Revolutionary Committee was demonstrated even more strikingly later the same night when the committee suddenly announced acceptance of the Petrograd military district's ultimatum to rescind its declaration of October 22nd. Information as to how this came about is fragmentary. <clears throat> Apparently, the Menshevik moderates, Gotz and Bogdanov, personally intervened in the committee's deliberations in an attempt to persuade committee members to withdraw their insistence on absolute control over the military command. Gotz and Bogdanov must have been dissatisfied with the initial response to this appeal because subsequently they issued an announcement that the Central Executive Committee was breaking relations with the Military Revolutionary Committee and departing from Smolny. The only published memoir account of this meeting is by Antonov. While obviously confused in some details, his recollection suggests that after Gotz and Bogdanov left the meeting, the Military Revolutionary Committee did, in fact, rescind its declaration at the firm insistence of the left SRs, who evidently threatened to withdraw from the committee if it did not, and Bolshevik moderates led by Ryazanov. If caution remained the watchword at Smolny, such was not the case in the Winter Palace, where Kerensky had by now decided that direct action to suppress the left could, could be delayed no longer. Receiving word of the Military Revolutionary Committee's apparent readiness to reach agreement with the Petrograd Military District, he dismissed the announcement as a tactic to delay temporarily a head-on military clash with the government, as indeed it was. Obviously underestimating the, de the degree to which potential military support for the government in the capital had disintegrated, and at any rate, counting on rapid reinforcements from the front, Kerensky announced his intention of arresting at once the entire membership of the Military Revolutionary Committee. But, as on the previous night, cooler heads prevailed upon Kerensky not to attempt quite so drastic a step. Rather, the cabinet agreed to initiate formal criminal proceedings against members of the Military Revolutionary Committee for circulating appeals for civil disobedience and activity against the lawful government. For immediately, they resolved to return to jail those Bolsheviks accused of participation in the July uprising, who, while free on bail, had conducted anti-government agitation of any kind. Implementation of this plan would have rounded up many of the left's top leaders, among them Trotsky. The cabinet also ordered the shutdown of Rabachi Put and Soldat, 
and evidently as a demonstration of, of impartiality, the extreme right papers, Zivoslovo and Novaya Rus, were decreed closed as well. The editors of these papers, along with the authors of articles calling for insurrection, were to be prosecuted on criminal charges. The headquarters of the Petrograd Military District was now instructed to take all measures required to implement these objectives. General Bagratuni issued orders to cadets from the Pavlov, Vladimir, and Const Konstantinov military schools in Petrograd and the officers' training schools in Petrov and Gachina a battery of horse artillery from Pavlovsk, a rifle regiment of war wounded from, from Tsarsko Selo, and the 1st Petrograd Women's Shock Battalion from Levashova to report for duty on the palace square. Anticipating a negative reaction to these measures from democratic circles, Kransky accepted the recommendations of his colleagues that he appear personally to justify and clarify them in the, in the pre-parliament the next day. But the provisional government's direct attack on the extreme left did not wait. Before daybreak on October 24th, a detachment of cadets and militiamen raided the Trude Printing Press, publishers of Rabachi Put, and officially shut it down. Several thousand fresh copies of the day's Rabachi Put were seized and some mattresses were destroyed. Entrances to the building were thereupon sealed and a permanent guard was posted to protect to prevent the press from reopening. 